Mary Slusser of Calabar, Pioneer Missionary by W.P. Livingston. Phase 5 Chapter 1 In Heathen Deeps The new sphere to which Miss Lesser felt she was called had been occupying her attention for some time. During one of the minor military expeditions into the interior, the troops were suddenly attacked by a tribe who fled at the first experience of discipline and firing. A lad who had been used by the soldiers was persuaded by some of their number to conduct them to the Great White Mother for her advice and help. When they appeared at use, she and they talked long and earnestly, and they returned consoled and hopeful. Sometime afterwards the guide came down on his own account, bringing a few other lads with him. Her influence was such that they wished to become godmen, and they returned to begin the first Christian movement in one of the most degraded regions of Nigeria. She knew nothing of the place save that it was away up in the northwest, on one of the higher reaches of the Inyong Creek, and a two days' journey for her by water. The lads lived in a town called Ikepi, an old slave center that had been in league with Arrow, and the focus of the trade of a wide and populous area. It was a closed market, no Calabar trader being allowed to enter. On her return from Scotland, the young man again appeared, saying that there were forty others ready to become Christians, begging her to come up, and offering to send down a canoe. She disliked all water journeys, and even on the quiet creek, was usually in a state of inward trepidation. But nothing could separate her from her duty, and she responded to the call. For eight hours she was paddled along the beautiful windings of the creek. Then a huge hippopotamus was encountered, and frightened her into landing for the night on the Ibibo side, where she put up in a wretched hut reeking with filth and mosquitoes. Here the chief was reaching out for the gospel, holding prayers in his house, and trying to keep Sabbath, though not a soul could read, and the people were laughing at him. As the creek made a bend, she left the canoe and trudged through the bush to Ikepi. She found the town larger and more prosperous than she had anticipated, with four different races mingling in the market. But the darkness was terrible, and the wickedness shameless, even the children being foul-mouthed and abandoned. The younger and more progressive men gave her a warm welcome, but the older chiefs were sulky. Poor old heathen souls, she remarked, they have good reason to be, with all they have to hope from tumbling down about their ears. The would-be Christians had begun to erect a small church, with two rooms for her at the end. That they were in earnest was proved by their attitude. She had eager and reverent audiences, and once, on going unexpectedly into a yard, she found two lads on their knees, praying to the white man's god. She made a survey of the district, and came to the conclusion that Ikepi was another strategic point, the key to several different tribes, which would be well to secure for the church, and she made up her mind to come and live in the two rooms, and work inland and backward towards Erechuku. There was a settlement to consider, but that, she thought, she could manage to carry along with the occupation of Ikebe. Her bright and eager spirit did not reckon with the frailties of the body. When she returned, she entered on a long period of weakness. Now and again deputations came down to her. Once a score of young men appeared, and before starting their business said, Let us pray. She made another visit, saw the beginnings of the church at Ikebe, and another at Inkanga on the creek bank, three miles below Ikebe, and what affected her more, heard rumors of a possible occupation by the Roman Catholics. I must come, she said to herself. On one journey she was accompanied by Miss Peacock, who rose still more highly in her regard on account of the resolute way in which she braved the awful smells in the village. On another, Mr. and Mrs. McGregor shared the hardships of the trip with her. When these two arrived at the landing beach for use, a note was put into their hands from Ma, to the effect that she had not been able to obtain a canoe, and they had better come to the house until she saw what the Lord meant by it. They remained at use some days, Ma suffering from fever, but refusing to postpone the trip, saying that if she had faith she would be able to go. They were to start early one morning, but her guests sought to keep her in sleep until it was too late. They succeeded until 1 a.m., when she awoke, gave directions about packing, and rose. "'What do you think of her?' they said of Jean. "'She's often like that. It gets better on the road,' she replied, which was true. As Ma herself said, "'I begin every day, almost every journey in pain.' and in such tiredness that I am sure I cannot go on. And whenever I begin, the strength comes, and it increases. The party left at 3.15 in the moonlight, and soon afterwards were in a canoe. For hours they paddled, past men with two-pronged fish spears, fishing, by long stretches of water lilies of dazzling whiteness. 
by farms where the fresh green corn was beginning to sprout, by extensive reaches of the jungle where buoyant birds flitted, and parrots chattered, and monkeys swang from branch to branch by a bridge of hands. They stopped for lunch, and Mr. McGregor was interested in watching her methods with the people. A chief wished to see the principal, and said he was anxious to place two more boys with him in the institute. She told Mr. McGregor to say he would see him after they had eaten. The business-like principal thought this was a waste of time, but she held that he must not cheapen himself. If he made food of more importance than the education of the boys, they would think him dignified and respect him, and she was right. By and by they came to a torturous canal, as narrow as a mill dam. It was with difficulty that the canoe was punted through. They swept on under trees, hung with orchards, where dragonflies flashed in and out of the sunlight. This was the country of the hippos, and the banks were scored by their massive feet. It was also, as they found to their cost, the haunt of ibots, a fly with a poisoning bite. After passing over a series of shallows, they reached Ike P. Beach towards dark, and camped in the unfinished church, Ma in the vestry, and the McGregors inside the building. Mr. McGregor had seen much of Nigeria, but he had never witnessed such degradation as he found existing here. The girls went without any clothing except a string of beads, and the married women wore only a narrow strip of cloth. He had again a lesson in native manners. Paying ceremonial visits to the chief, they sat and looked at the ground, and yawned repeatedly, and after a time left. To him the yawning seemed rude, but Ma said it was the correct thing, and when the chiefs returned the call he knew that, as usual, she was right. One of the questions that the chief asked was, Is this the man you have brought to stay and teach us? Ma turned to the principal with, with a wry face. Well, she said in English, I like that. They'll need to be content with something less than a B.D. for a wee bit, till they get started at any rate. She informed them who Mr. McGregor was and the great work he was doing in Calabar, and that in the goodness of his heart he had come up to see the position of things in the town. Ma, incredulously, do you mean that this is not the man who is to come and lead us out of darkness? No, he is not the man yet. Ma, reproachfully, you always say wait. We have waited two years, and again you come to us and say wait. When are you coming to us? There was nothing for it but to put them off once again. But she improved the occasion by extolling the Institute, with the result that when they left, two boys were taken to the canoe and consigned to Mr. McGregor's care, one decently clad in a singlet and loincloth, and the other with only a single bead hanging at the throat. Mr. McGregor was exploring on his own account, and came across a government rest house, perched in the brow of a cliff, with a magnificent view over the plain. Here he noticed that people were particularly opposed to white men. One of the villages Ma had labeled dangerous, and he learnt that when the court messengers appeared, they were promptly seized, beaten, and cast out. This, it is interesting to note, came to be the scene of Ma's last exploits. He rejoined the ladies at In Kinga, where the little native church had been completed. They held the opening service. The principal had no jacket. His shirt was torn. His boots bore traces of the stream and mud through which he had passed. Miss Lesser wore the lightest of garments. It was one of the strangest opening ceremonies in the history of missions, but they worshipped God from the heart. And Ma seemed lifted out of herself, and to be inspired, as she told the people what the church there in their midst meant, and the way they should use it for their highest good. The McGregors left her at Arachuku, and she continued down Creek. She had been upheld by her indomitable spirit the journey, but now collapsed, and was so ill that she had to spend the night in the canoe. In the darkness she was awakened by one of the babies, crying, but was so weak that she could not move. The girls were sound asleep, and could not hear her. Exerting her willpower, she rolled over to the child, whose head had become wedged between a box and the footboard of the canoe, and was being slowly killed. In the early dawn the journey was resumed to Okopedai Beach, and then she crawled over the weary miles to use. Chapter 2 Real Life I must go. I am in honor bound to go. It was her constant cry. She heard the services were being held regularly at Ikepi on Sundays and weekdays, and yet no one knew more than the merest rudiments of Christian truth. None could read. A teacher had gone from Esseng, but he was himself only at the stage of the first standard in the schools, and could impart but the crudest instruction. They were groping for the light, and worshipping what to most of them was still the unknown god, and yet were already able to withstand persecution. The pathos of the situation broke her down. Why, she cried, cannot the church send two ladies there? Why don't they use the money on hand for the purpose? If the wherewithal should fail at the end of two years, let them take my salary. I shall only be too glad to live on native food with my barons. Once more she went up, and once more she stood ashamed before the reproaches. She could not hold out any longer. I am coming, she said decisively. She was not well. She was never well now. She had bad nights, was always tired out, too tired for anything. Yet she went forward to the new life with unshakable fortitude. 
In a short time she was back with fifty sheets of corrugated iron and other material for the house. I am committed now, she wrote. No more idleness for me. I am entering in the dark as to how and where and when. How I am to manage I do not know, but my mind is at perfect peace about it, and I am not afraid. God will carry it through. The pillar leads. She did not care much for the situation that had been granted. It was low-lying, and she was anxious to conserve her health for the work's sake, but she had faith that she would be taken care of. Palm trees bordered the site on three sides, and amidst these the monkeys loved to romp. These palms, she said, are my first joy in the morning, when the dawn comes up, pearly gray in the midst and fine rain, fresh and cool and beautiful. She lived in two rooms at the back of the church, with a bit of ground fenced off for kitchen, and her furniture consisted of a camp bed and a few dishes. But she was chiefly out of doors, for she had as many as two hundred and fifty people engaged in cutting bush, leveling, and stumping. Despite the discomfort and worry incidental to such conditions, she was quite happy. The natives as a whole were hostile to white people. They wanted neither them nor their religion, but there was nothing martial or predatorial about Ma, and her very helplessness protected her. And there was that in her blood which made her face the conflict with zest. It always braced her to meet the dark forces of hell and conquer them with the simple power of the gospel. Her fearlessness was as marked as ever. One Sunday during service there was an uproar in the market. She went out and found a mom fighting with sticks and swords, a woman bleeding, and her husband wounded and at bay. She seized the man's wrist and compelled quiet, and soon settled the matter by Palavar. On another occasion the government sent native agents with police escort to vaccinate the people, as smallpox was rife. They resented the white man's juju, and there was much excitement. The conduct of the agents enraged the crowds, guns appeared, and bloodshed was imminent, when an appeal was made to Ma. She succeeded in calming the rising passions, and reassuring the people as to the purpose of the inoculation. This poor frail woman, she said, is the broken reed on which they lean. Isn't it strange? I'm glad, anyhow, that I'm of use in protecting the helpless. The people said if she would perform the operation they would agree, and she sent to Bindi for her lymph. I was busy for days. It was a difficult task. The people were suspicious, and she had to banter and joke and coax when she herself was at fainting point. Apart from this, she doctored men and women for the worst diseases, nursed the sickly babies, and generally acted her old part of a mother in Israel. It is real life I'm loving now, she wrote, not all preaching and holding meetings, but rather a life and an atmosphere which the people can touch and live in, and be made willing to believe in, when the higher truths are brought before them. In many things it is the most prosaic life, dirt and dust and noise and silliness and sin in every form, but full, too, of the kindliness and homeliness and dependence of children who are not adverse to be disciplined and taught, who understand and love just as we do. The excitements and surprises and novel situations would not, however, need to be continuous, as they wear and fray the body, and fret the spirit and rob one of sleep and restfulness of soul. Use was still her headquarters, and she often transversed the long stretch of creek, though the journey always left her terribly exhausted. On one occasion, when she had arrived at Yu's, racked with pain, she was asked how she would ever endure it. I just had to take as big a dose of laudanum as I dared, and wrap myself up in a blanket, and lie in the bottom of the canoe all the time, and managed fine. She often met adventures by the way. Once, after thirteen hours of the canoe, she arrived at Okopedai Beach late in the evening, along with Maddie and Whitey and a big boy baby. Stowing the baggage in the beach house, they started in the dark for Yu's. Ma carrying a box with five fowls and some odds and ends, and Maggie, who was ill, the baby. When they reached the house, they found they had no matches and were afraid of snakes, but she was so tired that she lay down as she was, on a bed piled high with clothes, the others on the floor, the baby crying itself to sleep. At Cock Crow, fire was obtained for the village, and a cup of tea made her herself again, and ready for the inevitable palavars. Again, she went up to Ikepe with supplies by night, and the water had risen, and she had to lie flat to escape the overhanging branches, and finally the canoe ran into a submerged tree, and three of the paddle boys were pitched into the water. Not long afterwards she left Ikepe at 6.30 a.m., was in the canoe all night, and reached the landing beach at 5.30 on Christmas morning with the usual motherless baby. On this occasion she received a message. A carry key said I was to tell you that his mother is asleep, referring to the death of one of the first members of the congregation, a gentle and superior woman of whom she had great regard. The wording of the message made her realize how soon the gospel had the power of changing even the language of the people. Sometime previously Annie's two-year-old son had died, and the question of a Christian burial place had been considered by the congregation. Heathen adults were buried in the house, and children under the doorstep. It seemed cruel to leave bodies out in the cold earth, but of their own volition the members secured a piece of ground and laid the child there, and now this woman was placed by his side. 
the first adult to obtain a Christian burial in that part of Ibibo. On New Year's Eve, she was down with fever and was very weak. But she wrote, My heart is singing all the time to him whose love and tender mercy crown all the days. In the middle of the night, she was obliged to rise. First, feet were driver ants, thousands of thousands of them pouring in on every side and dropping from the roof. We had two hours' hard work to clear them out. Chapter 3 The Autocratic Doctor Returning from Ikepe on one occasion in 1911, she found that a tornado had played havoc with the used house, and immediately set to, and with her own hands repaired it. The strain was too great for her enfeebled frame, and symptoms of heart weakness developed. She had nights of high fever and delirium, and yet so great was her power of will that she would rise next day and teach and work, while on Sunday she took the services, although she was unable to stand. I had a grand day, she would say, notwithstanding intense weakness. Dr. Robertson of I2 had gone home on furlough, and there came to take his place Dr. Hitchcock, a young, eager, clear-headed man, as masterful in his quiet way as Ma. He had proposed going to China in the service of the church, but agreed meanwhile to put in a year at I2. She watched him for a time with glowing admiration, as all the curiosity of the natives turned rapidly to confidence, then to appreciation, then to blind devotion to worship. When she looked at the great crowds flocking day after day to the dispensary and hospital, she thought of the scene of old, when the poor and halt and maimed gathered round Christ. A rare man, she said, a rare Christian, a rare doctor, a physician of her soul and body, and beginning to love him like a son. And like a son he treated her. Although he had scarcely a minute to spare from his work, he ran up every second day to use to study her. He believed that she was not being nourished, that there were grounds for his suspicions her own diary recorded. There was money for her in Duke Town, and she had often checks lying beside her, but was not always able to obtain ready cash, and sometimes she ran out. On June 14th she wrote, Market morning, have only 3D in cash in, in the house, send it with two Ikepats, the first Efix school book, and a New Testament to buy food, and sold all three books for 3D. Got five small yams, oil and shrimps, with pepper and a few small fish. It was on the following morning, as early as 6 a.m. It was on the following morning, as early as six o'clock, that the doctor called to examine her again. His decision was that she was not to go to Ikepe. She was not to cycle. She was to lie down as much as possible. She laughed, and on the Sunday went to church and conducted two services. But she almost collapsed, and when the doctor came next day, he ordered her to take to her bed and not go to any more meetings until she obtained his permission. Mary had at last met her equal in resolution. He is very strict, she confessed, but he is a dear man. Thank God for him. A trip to Ikepe, which she had planned for the McGregors, had to be cancelled, and they decided to go to use instead, and aid and abet the doctor in his care of her. She got up to receive them, and then wrote, The doctor sent me back to bed under a more stringent rule than ever. Very stern. I dare not rise. You must eat meat twice a day, the doctor said. I am not a meat-eater, doctor, she rejoined. His reply was to send over a fowl from Ituk with instructions as to his cooking. Why did you send that fowl, doctor? she said next day because it could not come itself, was all the satisfaction she got. It was not the first fowl that came from I-2, the next came cooked, while the McGregors telegraphed to Duke Town for their entire stock. What a trouble you dear folk take, she sighed. You will have to go to Duke Town for a change, she suggested to the doctor one day. Nay, nay, she replied, I've all my plans laid, and I cannot draw a salary and not do what I can. You have done so well in the past, remarked Mr. G McGregor, that you need not have any qualms about that. I have been paid for all I've done, was her retort. But the doctor insisted, and the very thought of leaving the station and the household work unattended to put her in a fever. Of course, she said, to the doctor my health is the only thing, but I cannot get rest for my body while my mind is torn about things. He is vexed, and I am vexed at vexing him. Not satisfied with the progress she was making, the doctor transferred her to Hughes, where she was under his constant observation. Life is hardly worth living, she complained, but I am doing what I can to help him to help me, so that I can be fit again for another spell of work. That was her one desire to be well enough to go back to the bush. A messenger from Ikebe came down to find out when she was returning. Seven weeks, was the doctor's firm reply. I may run up sooner than that, was hers. I'm quite well, if you'd only believe it. But it was well on towards the end of the year before she was, in her own words, out of the clutches of the dearest and cleverest and most autocratic mission doctor that ever lived. She literally ran away and was up at Ikebe at once, exultant as having the privilege of ministering once again to the needs of the people. There was a throng at the beach to welcome her. She was soon as busy as she had ever been, though she was usually carried now to and from church and other meetings. Jean she placed at Inkenga as teacher and evangelist, the people giving her one S per week and her food. 
Ma providing her clothes. It was astonishing to her to see how she had developed. An insatiable reader, she would place a book open anywhere in order that she might obtain a glimpse of the words in passing, reminding Ma of her own device in the Dundee weaving shed. Her knowledge of the Bible was so thorough and correct that the latter considered her the best effect teacher she knew. Soon she gathered about her some two hundred men and women from the upper Inyong farms, who were greatly pleased with her preaching. She came over to Ikepe for Christmas, the first the household had spent in that savage land, and there was service in the church, which was decorated with palms and wreaths of ferns. Mary told the story of Bethlehem, and the scholar lads, of their own accord, marched through the town singing hymns. About this time Miss Lester rendered important service to the mission by her testimony before an imperial government commission, which had been sent out to investigate the effects of the import, sale, and consumption of alcoholic liquor in southern Nigeria. She proved very convincing evidence of the demoralization caused through drink, but with keen intuition she felt that little would come of the palaver, and she was right. Chapter 4 God's Wonderful Palaver Her attitude to money was as unconventional as her attitude to most things. It had no place in her interest. She never thought of it except as a means of helping her to carry out her projects. How I wish we could do without it, she would often used to say. I have no head for it, or for business. Her salary she counted as church money, and never spent a penny of it on herself except for bare living. And until the last years, the girls received nothing but food and their clothes. You say, she wrote to one giver, that you would like me to spend the money on my personal comfort. Dear friend, I need nothing. My every want is met and supplied without my asking. Her belief was thus expressed. What is money to God? The difficult thing is to make men and women. Money lies all about us in the world, and he can turn it on to our path as easily as he can send a shower of rain. Her faith was justified in a marvelous way, for throughout all these years and onwards to the end she obtained all she needed, and that was not little. She required funds for extension, for building, for furniture, for teachers' wages, for medicines, for the schooling of her children, and many other purposes, and yet she was never in want. Nothing came from her people, for she would not accept collections at first, not wishing to give them the impression that the gospel was in any way connected with money. It came from friends, known and unknown, at home and abroad, who were interested in her and in her brave and lonely struggle. They were scarcely a mail that did not bring her a check or a bank draft or a post office order. It often happened, she said once, that when the purse is empty, immediately comes a new installment. God is superbly kind in the matter of money. I do not know how to thank him. It is just wonderful how we ever fail in our trust for a moment. On one occasion, when she was a little anxious, she cried, Shame on you, Mary Slusser, after all you know of him. Her attitude toward all this giving was one of curious detachment. She looked upon herself as an instrument carrying out the wishes of the people at home, who supplied the means, and she gave them the honor of what was accomplished. Their gifts justified her going forward in the work. Each fresh ten-pound note she took as a sign to advance another stage, so that, in one sense, she felt her church was backing up her efforts. As she regarded herself as being owned by the church, all the money she received was devoted exclusively to its service. Even donations from outside sources she would not use for personal needs. One day she received a letter from the governor, conveying to her, with the thanks of the government, a gift of twenty-five pounds to herself, in recognition of her work. The letter she valued more than the money, which she would only accept as a contribution toward her home for women. All the sons were handed over to Mr. Wilkie or Mr. McGregor, who banked them at Duketown, and they formed a general fund upon which she drew when necessary. She looked upon this fund as belonging to the Mission Council, to be used for extension purposes either up the Cross River or the Inyong Creek or for the home for women and girls, when the scheme matured, and she never sought to have control of it. Mr. Wilkie was always afraid that she was not just to herself, and she had sometimes to restrain him from sending more than she required. It was the same later when Mr. Hart, C.A., had charge of the accounts. This explains why on more than one occasion she was reduced to borrowing or selling books in order to obtain food for herself and her household. There was money in abundance in Duke Town, but she would not ask it for private necessities. Sometimes, also, she was so remote from civilization that she was unable to cash a check or draft in time to meet her wants. Many a hidden romance lay behind these gifts that came to her, the romance of love and sacrifice and devotion to Christ. One day there arrived a sum of fifty pounds, accompanied by a charming letter. Long she looked at both with wonder and tears. Her thoughts went back to the Edinburgh days when she was a girl, on the eve of leaving for Calabar. One of her friends there was a Bible woman, who was very good to her. Always on her furlough, she had gone to see her in the humble home in which she lived an invalid, or, as Mary expressed it, lingering at the gates of the city. 
she thought she must now be dependent upon others, for she was old and frail, and yet here she had sent out ten pounds to help on her work. If there was romance in the giving, there was pathos in the spending. Acknowledging some she was bidden expend upon herself, she would go into detail as to her purchases, a new Efic Bible to replace her old tattered copy, the hire of three boys to carry her over the streams, seed cocoa yams for the girls' plots, a basin and ewer for her guest room. I can't, she said, ask guests to wash in a pail, a lamp, and so on. She thus sought to explain the spinning of every penny. Is that extravagant? Is that too selfish? she anxiously asked. After enumerating a number of things which she intended to buy for the Ekpe house, she said, Doesn't that seem too prosaic? But it will clarify your views of vision work and make them more practical and real, for, you see, the missionary cannot go about like Adam and Eve, and the natives must be taught cleanliness and order, and be civilized as well as Christianized. Her own small financial affairs have been in the hand of her old friend Mr. Logic, Dundee, whose death in 1910 sent her into silence and darkness for weeks. He had been like a father to her. To him, indeed, she chiefly owed the realization of her dream to be a missionary. She did not know for a time how she stood, and as her purse was nearly empty, she was growing anxious, when a small amount arrived from a friend to whom she wrote. I have been praying for a fortnight for money to come from somewhere, as I have been living on seven shillings, given to the children by a merchant here, who is a great friend of our household. So your gift is a direct answer to prayer. Before they call, I will answer." She applied to Mr. Slight, another tried friend who had been treasurer of the United Presbyterian Church, and took a warm interest in all the missionaries, and after the union was the accountant for the United Free Church. He made matters simple and clear to her understanding, and set her fears at rest. She had no debts of any kind save debts of gratitude. Mr. Slight's death in 1912 again made her feel orphaned. I had no idea how much I lent on him till he was removed, and it seems now that my last link with the old church has snapped. What he has done for me through a score of years I can never acknowledge warmly enough. In later years her affairs at homes were managed by Miss Adam. Congregations continued to send her boxes of goods whilst her own friends were unceasing in their thought of her. I should never mention a watch, she told them, because you just take it up and bear the burden yourselves, and it makes me feel ashamed. Here are all my needs and clothing, for the children myself anticipated, and here are luxuries of food and good things, and all steeped and folded in the most delicate and tender sympathy and love. Surely no one has so many mercies as I have. She saw a few pretty things, and had never the opportunity of looking into a shop window, so that the arrival of these boxes was an occasion of much pleasurable excitement to her and to the girls. Her only trouble was that she could not hand on some of the food to others. When you have a good thing, or read a good thing, or see a humorous thing, and cannot share it, it is worse than having to bear a trial alone. She was particularly grateful for a box of Christmas goods that came in 1911. She had been much upset by the local food, and she ate nothing but shortbread and bun for a week, and that made her better. The people about her, too, were kind. Women would bring her presents of produce. One, for instance, gave her fifteen large yams and half a crown bag of rice and a large quantity of shrimps. You are a stranger in these markets, she said, and the children may be hungry.